Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Tuesday, everybody. So, U.S. President Joe Biden's East Asia trip to Korea and Japan has concluded, and there are two major developments we need to discuss. The first is the U.S. President's comments on Taiwan, and the second is the announcement of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. Of course, we anticipated last week that we would likely see these two developments yesterday. Let's start by looking at the Taiwan statement. Now, for context, we understand that Taiwan policy. Is the most sensitive aspect of U.S.-China relations and remains the most dangerous、uh, flashpoint between the two powers. We also remember that the U.S. has maintained a policy called strategic ambiguity towards Taiwan for decades now. Strategic ambiguity, also known as deliberate ambiguity or strategic uncertainty, is the practice by a government of being intentionally ambiguous on certain aspects of foreign policy. Proponents of the policy argue that it can take advantage of risk aversion. To bolster a general deterrent strategy, the main critique of the policy is that it increases the risk of misinterpretation and thus miscalculation. Okay, so moving back to the U.S. president's statements at a press conference in Tokyo yesterday, Monday, a reporter asked President Biden if the United States would defend Taiwan if it were attacked. Biden responded with, "Quote: Yes, that's the commitment we made." End quote, and continued with, quote, "We agree with a one-China policy. We've signed onto it, and all the intended agreements made from there. But the idea that that it can be taken by force, just taken by force, is just not. It's just not appropriate." End quote. Such an unambiguous statement raised the question: Of course, is U.S. strategic ambiguity policy towards Taiwan over? Well, officially, soon after the press event with the president, American officials were quick to explain that the president's statement constituted no departure at all from America's long-standing Taiwan policy of ambiguity, pointing out that just a few days before, Jake Sullivan, Biden's national security advisor, had stressed that America's Taiwan policy had not changed. Other U.S. officials speaking to U.S. media explained. That when the president said the U.S. would intervene militarily, he meant providing weapons, not deploying U.S. forces, which would be consistent with the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act. This is an act that the U.S. recognized as underpinning its relationship with China and Taiwan, but the People's Republic of China does not recognize. UK-based Japanese-owned Financial Times writes that its sources within the Japanese government express, "quote It was unclear whether Biden's comments were intentional or not, but they were seen positively by." Tokyo as a message that would serve as deterrence against China. End quote. On this development, Washington-based veteran China analyst Bill Bishop made the following observation: quote, "How many gaffes has Biden made about the U.S. defending Taiwan that the White House then tries to clean up? At some point, obviously, they are not gaffes. And if you are she, you assume U.S. will defend Taiwan. So strategic ambiguity looks dead." The next questions should be: Which weapons? When can the U.S. deliver them? Does the U.S. have ammunition to spare for Taiwan? And how would the U.S. get weapons to Taiwan in the event of a conflict if the People's Liberation Army is blockading the island? End quote. He continues by expressing that one lesson that the People's Liberation Army could rationally take from the Ukraine conflict is that any attempt to take the island by force will only get harder the longer they wait. As Taiwan may get more serious about its defense, and the U.S. and its allies may get more serious about preparing with Taiwan for the fight. Unsurprisingly, Beijing was not pleased with Biden's statement. Soon after, People's Republic of China Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin expressed, "Quote: The relevant remarks of the U.S. side misrepresent history and distort facts." End quote. State-run Global Times wrote in a piece the same day, quote, "If the Biden administration insists on playing this game, China-U.S. relations would be like the Titanic hitting an iceberg, ending in crisis." Or worse. This brings us to the second development. Yesterday in Tokyo, U.S. President Biden also launched the so-called Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity (IPEF) with a dozen initial partners: Australia, Brunei, India, Indonesia, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Malaysia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. A bloc which together represents 40% of world GDP. 
One country, not included of course, is the People's Republic of China. The IPEF seeks to provide an alternative US-Japanese driven regulatory environment to a Chinese driven one in the region. For example, the US and Japan hope to use the agreement to set international rules on the digital economy, supply chains, decarbonization and regulations applying to workers. However, unlike the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the IPEF is not a free trade agreement, which is currently very unpopular politically in the United States. As such, it will provide limited economic gravity to counterbalance the pull of the Chinese market in the region. Both Western and Japanese media reported that in the lead-up to the Tokyo meeting yesterday, at the last minute, the Biden administration agreed to dilute the language of the IPEF announcement from, quote, launch negotiations, end quote, to, quote, start consultations, end quote. It is reported that Tokyo had urged Washington to be more flexible to increase the chances of more Southeast Asian nations signing on to the plan. Next up, the lockdowns. But quickly guys, if you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to hit the like button, it's a huge help. And for anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help keep China updates sustainable, keep this channel going, uh, Patreon and buy me a coffee, links are in the description below. In recent days, we have seen a slow tightening of restrictions in the capital. This is in stark contrast to a Shanghai which is gradually, though slowly, loosening things up. Yesterday, Monday, People's Republic of China Vice Premier and COVID control czar Sun Chunlan undertook an official inspection of Beijing in places where clusters have been reported in recent days. According to state media, she called for a faster response to eliminate infection Infectious, uh, infections rather outside controlled areas as soon as possible to quote secure people's health and ensure the quality of life and work is in order end quote this is an interesting move analysts have been quick to point out that normally when ms sun does one of these visits strict measures follow Indeed, state media has used the language giving directions for pandemic response work, which is employed when the central government is giving direct orders to local authorities. Mass testing across the country and in the city of Beijing continues. 16.25 million people were tested in Beijing on Saturday alone, about 82% of the city's residents. As of yesterday, five districts, Chaoyang, Fengtai, Fangshan, Haidian and Shunyi have asked employees to work from home. These districts alone account for over 10 million people in one of the wealthiest and most powerful cities in the country. Beijing has begun moving thousands of residents from high-risk groups as well as high school stu uh, students to Zhangjiakou, host city of the 2021 Winter Olympics, to the northwest of the city. Meanwhile, an hour by high-speed rail to the east of the capital sits the critical port city of Tianjin, population 15 million. As we've seen over the last week or so, the outbreak there is looking worrisome in that the risk of lockdowns is dramatically increasing. Mass testing continues to roll out across the country. As of Monday, 20 Chinese cities and five provinces have implemented a policy of at least one weekly COVID-19 test, making negative results mandatory to access public transport, malls, and in some cases, one's own residential building. Some cities, like Zhejiang's provincial capital, Hangzhou, home of Alibaba, require testing of all residents every 48 hours. And last up, the Chinese economy. And in a move that suggests increasing fears about the poor state of the national economy, China's state council in a special executive meeting announced an incredible 33 new measures to support the economy, including more tax breaks, real estate easing, subsidies, and infrastructure stimulus. Premier Li Keqiang, who chaired the meeting, admitted that, quote, China's economy faces mounting downward pressure and many market entities are in difficulty. End quote, stressing that economic fundamentals must be stabilized. Of course, many local officials are between a rock and a hard place. Demanded by the Politburo Standing Committee to prioritize COVID-19 prevention and control, while also directed by the State Council to stabilize its economic fundamentals. Woe be to the servant with two masters. Let's go through some of the major measures announced by the State Council yesterday. Value-added tax credit refunds will be extended to more industries, a move that is expected to bring the 
total amount of tax refunds and reductions to 2.64 trillion RMB, 400 billion US dollars this year. Support loans to micro and small businesses will be doubled. China will also stabilize industrial and supply chains, optimize policies that support the early reopening of enterprises and their full capacity production, according to the readout. The civil aviation industry will also be granted an additional emergency loan of 150 billion yuan, or 22 billion US dollars, and China will issue 300 billion yuan of railway construction bonds. More hydropower and coal-fired power plants will be built this year also. China will boost consumer spending, it says, though it does not explain how it will do this, and consumer spending has been smashed these last few months. Analysts have expressed doubt that these measures, though substantial, can do much to bolster the economy as long as rolling lockdowns remain a risk. Indeed, today, Tuesday, UBS Group AG cut its year-on-year gross domestic product growth forecast to 3% from 4.2% on the condition that China returns the growth from the third quarter and receives substantial policy support, expressing in a note, quote, The lingering restrictions and lack of clarity on an exit strategy from the current COVID policy will likely dampen corporate and consumer confidence and hinder the release of pent-up demand. End quote. This is very much consistent with what we have been stressing on China Update for months now. Of course, Beijing's target for 2022 remains a very high 5.5%.